Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian in Northern Virginia, where we're covering the 29th Annual Surface Navy Association's Conference and Trade Show. Full disclosure, our coverage here is sponsored by Raytheon, and we have with us uh, Thad Smith, who is the uh, Marketing Manager for uh, Raytheon's SM-6 uh, Standard Missile 6. Sir, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the, the time we have together. Talk to us a little bit about you know the big news that you guys have at the show. Obviously, the U.S. government gave you export clearance on the SM-6 uh, missile. How important is that, and who are the likely customers for this really, really high-end capability? So it's important because uh, we are able to continue to grow the program. Uh, that growth uh, to those international customers enables us to lower the cost to the U.S. government uh, at the end of the day just based on production numbers that are in place. Some of those international customers that we may be able to sell to are based on the capabilities that they either have declared themselves to upgrade their combat system, their weapon system, or have already procured from the U.S. government. So those countries are Australia, who have declared in their out-year budgets that they want to do a combat systems upgrade that could have the capability for SM-6, and Korea and Japan, who are procuring Aegis Base Line 9 destroyers that could have the capability to fire SM-6 or SM-3 for that matter. And uh, obviously the um, Australians are the Hobart class, they're going to have uh, three, three ships in that class. Is this also going to open up for other countries that may not have the Aegis combat system, may not have cooperative engagement capability, uh, say the Brits for example, uh, or any other nation that may want this capability that may not be on the market elsewhere? So our current weapon uh, utilizes an S-band uplink to enable the missile to fly in its semi-active mode or communicate to the missile. We've been doing internal investments of how do we add a additional band such as in Denmark, uh, Germany, or the Netherlands that the uh, SM-6 could fly there or an SM-3 because those two missile stacks are common and so that development activity would apply to both uh, that, those two missiles. Do, um, one of the things uh, that uh, is a little bit confusing for people are, the, you know, even for some involved in this, is the sheer number of standard missiles that exist, right? You have the SM-2, you have the SM-3, now you have the SM-6, uh, you have the SM-6, uh, you know, dual one, you know. Walk us through a little bit about the families, what each one of them does, to clarify for our viewers who may themselves be confused about what exactly a standard missile is. So the standard missile family has been around since uh, over 60 years, so well beyond my age. Uh, so that family of effectors, we start with the SM-1 uh, that some countries in the international market space are still employing on their ships. We still do maintenance for them. Uh, that will start to sense sunset in the 2020s. Uh, we have the standard missile 2 family, which the U.S. Navy has pr procured uh, thousands of those rounds for uh, medium-range defense of, uh, of, of against AAW anti-air warfare targets uh, in, in, the, in the atmosphere. So with SM-3, SM-3 is designed to go against short-range and medium-range ballistic missile targets in the exo-atmosphere. So outside the atmosphere and not inside the atmosphere, uh, that's where we engage those targets with the, the kill vehicle that's inside the SM-3. So there is no warhead in an SM-3. It actually it does hit to kill against those targets. SM-6 was the expansion of the SM-2 to be able to reach much further than SM-2 does today because we want to start to stretch where our enemies are operating under. We want to be able to engage them in a much longer range so that we can engage them before they fire upon us. Uh, so the SM-6, you know, lots of different terminology associated with that. Uh, the first iteration was that we had SM-6 in the long-range AAW mission. Uh, That's anti-air warfare. Anti-air warfare, yes. So then we looked at what else could SM-6 do? So funding from the Missile Defense Agency, we were able to do software modifications to the missile to be able to fly SM-6 against a ballistic missile target in its terminal phase of flight. So that's called our sea-based terminal role. So the missiles we're delivering today have both AAW and sea-based terminal, and that terminology, what we use, is called SM-6 Dual-1. Back in January of 2016, we demonstrated an anti-surface capability with SM-6. Uh, that was a software modification that we did to carry over the legacy software that was embedded in the SM-2 to demonstrate that against a surface target. Missiles that we'll start to deliver later in 2017 will then have all three capabilities, uh, again, based on software modifications. So we have three missions in one missile. It is a great cost savings to the U.S. government. And what you're looking at is roughly 300 SM6s have been delivered, and there's about 1,800 uh, in the program of record, correct? Correct. That's uh, inside the Navy program guide is the 1,800. And we believe that that could expand based on 
where we, we are seeing SM6 potentially be used in some of the adjacent market spaces that the government's looking at. What are some of the other adjacent spaces you guys are looking at? Some of the other adjacent spaces, what we've already talked about is can we expand uh, outside the Aegis family to other ships that uh, don't have the Aegis weapon system, have other controls for effectors? Uh, could we use it in, a, in, in an army configuration, uh, land-based, to utilize SM6? So there's always a cost point that you have to worry about of, of, of cost per kill, but maybe you want a high-end capability and then a low-end capability. So you can imagine all the different uh, army systems that we could integrate into. Um, this has been an evolutionary system, and friends of mine have said, look, if you were doing this from scratch, you might not design the missile exactly the way that it is now. You guys have tried to keep, and to keep that system as fresh as possible with as much, uh, you know, and lower maintenance costs and everything else. Is there any consideration for changing the stack itself, which is a very compl complex, uh, more, perhaps a little bit more labor intensive of a production scheme than you might have, for example, with a newer design missile? So we've continually looked at how do we upgrade the missile, and we look at that from based on a threat perspective and also from a obsolescence. So parts, parts manufacturers, they, they stop producing. We have to redesign different components. Uh, the threat is starting to go in new places and new spaces, and so how can we accommodate the missile? Does it need to go faster? Does it need to fly differently? Uh, as we approach the, uh, the atmosphere, what do we need to do to accommodate that? And so those are the things we work with our partners in the Navy, of looking at our roadmap of how can we Raytheon invest and in the government invest so that we can uh, have a product that's uh, ready for the force uh, of the future. And what are some of the other, uh, you know, you said like preparing for that force, force of the future. Um, you guys are uh, one of the world's leading missile makers. What are some of the things that you guys are looking at there over the horizon in terms of threats and challenges that, um, you know, you're working to shape that sort of intellectual battle space for the programs that are coming down uh, over the coming years? So it's really looking at uh, in partnership with our customers. Uh, we, we have a, a product line in, in, in Raytheon Missile Systems that focuses specifically on advanced things, uh, working with DARPA, working with NRL, uh, working with APL. How do we develop new technology? How do we take that to where it can be producible? And, and that's the partnership that we have with the government to be able to, to bring that into the production lines of tomorrow. And cost control is a big thing. Uh, obviously, you know, every weapon is, is under focus. We've seen that now with the president-elect and some of the tweets that he's been making. What are some of the things that you're doing across the standard line to try to take as much cost out of it? Because, for example, you know, if you look at it, you, you could use an SM6 in an anti-surface mode. On the other hand, there are also other tailored weapons that may be less expensive to do that, right? For example, you know, whether you're shooting a Tomahawk or, or, or something else. So it's great to have that kind of capability, but obviously, as you said, there's a price point challenge there all the time. What are some of the things you're doing to take cost out of those? The, uh, this platform. So some of the things we're doing today is, is what, what we do continually. So the, the booster stack on SM6 and SM3 are essentially the same. So we get that cost benefit. Uh, when we bundle those within Raytheon. Uh, one example would be that could we go to a multi-year concept for either SM6 or SM3? Uh, once uh, the SM6 is funded through the Navy, SM3 is funded through the Missile Defense Agency, then you have to get cooperation between the two agencies. Uh, could we do that in a bundled buy? Could that be directed from the DOD to the two services to allow us to go forward and, and, and procure those in a multi-year concept uh, with both effectors uh, to drive huge, huge cost savings uh, to the government taxpayer just based on volume so that it allows us to go out and, and procure their parts in advance and, and drive down the cost for the taxpayer. That, thanks very much and best of luck at the show. All right. Thank you very much. Cheers.